Welcome viewers to yet another exciting journey into the depths of time. Welcome to my channel, where we explore far into history, leaving no stones unturned. Today, as promised, we look at the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte and his ultimate downfall. I have already released a detailed documentary exploring the time before his reign and how he ultimately rose through the ranks of the French army to eventually become its emperor. If you have not seen that, then be sure to check it out. We continue this historical journey in the year 1805 when the Third Coalition began. Napoleon, now the Emperor of the French, obtained a rather large victory over a coalition of European powers. This coalition was formed due to concerns about Napoleon's increasing influence and territorial expansion in Europe. Austria, Russia, and the United Kingdom were the major participants of this alliance against Napoleon. This goes to show how much Napoleon had grown in power and authority as these countries felt threatened by him. Interesting. Anyways, one of the highlights of this war was the Battle of Austerlitz. During the battle, Napoleon positioned his troops on the Pratzen Heights, drawing the Allies into a vulnerable position. As the Allies attacked the French center, Napoleon launched a decisive counterattack, breaking through their lines and ultimately forcing the coalition forces into a disorderly retreat. If you have already seen my last video, then this would be no surprise, as Napoleon was a great military strategist. The French casualties were considerably lower than those of the Allies. The battle had far-reaching consequences for the War of the Third Coalition, leading to the collapse of the coalition and the signing of the Treaty of Pressburg in December 1805. If that interests you, then why not smash that subscribe button to stay updated with my historical videos. Your support really does help as it pushes this video to a wider audience. Without further ado, let's continue. Now, Russia was a major threat to Napoleon, and yet he was able to avert them because of this victory. Russia was forced to make peace with France after their defeat, which is a smart way to deal with stronger opponents, if I do say so myself. Anyways, we continue into the Fourth Coalition, which was also a victory for Napoleon. This marked a significant phase in the Napoleonic Wars. This coalition was in 1d806 and ended in 1d807. Yet again, European powers felt threatened by Napoleon's ambitions to expand further. Upon this, they decided to intervene in France's affairs in Germany, which brings us to the Battle of Gina Auerstedt on October 14, 1806. This was when Napoleon faced off against the Prussian army commanded by Frederick William Roman III. Now to give some context, this army was sent by these European forces who were focused on eradicating Napoleon's dreams of expansion. Now we know how far they are willing to go and how they never stop, because this is the fourth time countries have united against Napoleon, and to no avail, they have failed every time. Now, back to the main point, the Battle of Gina Auerstedt. The engagements occurred near the towns of Gina and Auerstedt in modern-day Germany. Napoleon skillfully outmaneuvered the Prussian forces, employing a double envelopment strategy, leading to a decisive victory for the French. For those unsure, let me explain. The double envelope strategy, also known as the pincer movement or flanking maneuver, is a military tactic in which a force attacks the enemy simultaneously from two sides. The goal of this strategy is to surround the opposing force, creating a pocket or encirclement, and thereby gaining a positional and numerical advantage. This tactic is effective in isolating and overwhelming the enemy by attacking from multiple directions. Anyways, this defeat shattered the Prussian military. Now, what is taken by the sword is kept with the pen. With this, I mean Napoleon pursued diplomatic solutions with Russia and Prussia. He wanted to solidify his gains in Europe and to make peace with these nations. The Treaty of Tilsit was signed between France, represented by Napoleon, and Russia, represented by Tsar Alexander I, along with Prussia. The treaty was negotiated in the town of Tilsit, modern-day Sovetsk, Russia, on the banks of the Neman River. These European powers lost significant territories and became allies of France. Now, the Treaty of Tilsit left Britain as one of the few major European powers not aligned with Napoleon. This led to the implementation of the Continental System, 
an attempt to economically isolate Britain by prohibiting European trade with the island nation. As we have seen before, the peace in the region did not last long. Let's continue into the Fifth Coalition. The Fifth Coalition was formed in 1809 and included Austria, the United Kingdom, Spain and Portugal, among others. But my fellow viewers, in order to understand the reasoning for another alliance of European powers, we must first look into another war, which sparked the encouragement of the few European powers left to stand against Napoleon's French Empire. Welcome to the Peninsular War, which took place in the years 18808 to 18814. This was a significant conflict in the Iberian Peninsula involving Spain, Portugal, and their allies against the forces of Napoleon's French Empire. This all erupted when Napoleon decided to invade Spain and Portugal. Up to this point, Napoleon had always been on the safe side when it came to gaining land. This was through diplomacy, and in some cases when he understood he would be unsuccessful, he turned around. What I am trying to say is that Napoleon was intelligent, and it was this that led him to victory. Now, we can see that Napoleon has started to change his ways of securing land, and we will see later as to how this would be his demise. Back to the war, this conflict kicked off with Spanish and Portuguese resistance against the French forces with the emergence of guerrilla warfare. No folks, not that guerrilla. To shed some light on guerrilla warfare, this is a form of irregular warfare characterized by small, mobile combat groups engaging in hit-and-run tactics, ambushes and surprise attacks against a larger and more conventional military force. The term guerrilla is often associated with unconventional tactics, and guerrilla warfare is typically employed by non-state actors, such as insurgent groups, rebels or militias. In terms of the Peninsula War, the local populations were assisted by British and Portuguese forces in an attempt to resist the occupying French army. The Peninsular War was a protracted and challenging campaign for the French, marked by numerous battles, sieges and the persistent guerrilla tactics employed by the Spanish and Portuguese resistance fighters. It had significant implications for the overall Napoleonic Wars as it tied down substantial French forces and weakened Napoleon's hold on the Iberian Peninsula. Now, on to the Fifth Coalition which was formed between Austria, the United Kingdom, Portugal and Spain, among others. This coalition was formed in 1809. Austria, led by Archduke Charles, sought to challenge French dominance in Central Europe and regain territories lost in previous conflicts. Looking into the history, I have found this rather interesting that these nations have constantly attacked the French Empire and up to this point they have always failed. If you find this as interesting as I do, why not leave a comment expressing that, and smash that like button so others can be fascinated by this video. Back to the subject, the war between Austria and France saw several significant battles, including the Battle of Aspern Essling in May 1809, where the Austrians achieved a temporary success against Napoleon, but were ultimately defeated in the follow-up Battle of Wagram in July 1809. Napoleon truly was a master on the battlefield. The war concluded with the Treaty of Schönbrunn in October 1809, in which Austria had to cede territory and accept French influence in the region. Yet again, another victory for France. If you are thinking what I am thinking, that is, what role did the United Kingdom play in this? This country actively supported the coalition by providing financial and military assistance. So folks, the Fifth Coalition was a victory for France, yet this also brought about challenge for French domination in the region as there was an increase in resistance towards the expansion of the French Empire. Now, the focus of this video was to highlight Napoleon's rule and his subsequent abdication from the throne. This is the part that you have all been waiting for. Brace yourselves as we dive into the fall of this courageous figure. What really kickstarted Napoleon's demise was when he decided to invade Russia during the winter. I mention the season as this is what inevitably meant defeat for the French army under Napoleon's command. Now, a soldier follows orders, but only to a certain point. When conditions are harsh, a soldier really does question themselves as to why they are there. The morale of a soldier can decline during a campaign when all seems lost and when there is no one there to physically fight. 
I say this as the Russians, realizing the French soldiers breaching into their lands, took it upon themselves to strategically retreat. This was of course after the French army's first encounter with the Russians, led by General Mikhail Kutuzov, in a battle which the French won. The strategic retreat was decided after this, but by the time the French army made their way through the vastness of the Russian landscape, they were overcome by the harsh weather. When they reached Moscow, they saw that it had been largely abandoned and set ablaze by the retreating Russians. Despite occupying Moscow, the French could not secure a decisive victory and the situation became increasingly dire. As temperatures plummeted, the Grand Army found itself ill-prepared for the harsh Russian winter. Supplies dwindled, and the soldiers suffered from frostbite, hunger, and disease. The situation worsened on the retreat as the Russian scorched earth policy deprived the retreating army of essential resources. This must have been a harsh battle for Napoleon and for the people that stood behind him. This defeat would go down in history as it would be his first major defeat as emperor. All this time, Napoleon was known for his brilliant mind. The series of defeats that you are about to hear of would ultimately destroy his reputation as a great military strategist, and it would also mean that his people would lose faith in him. Carrying on from my last comment, the retreat from Moscow began in October, and the conditions were brutal. The retreating soldiers faced constant harassment from Russian forces and partisan attacks. The lack of adequate winter clothing and provisions contributed to the rapid deterioration of the French army. By the time the remnants of the Grand Army crossed the Berezina River in November, they were in a desperate state. Thousands of soldiers perished due to the cold, hunger, and Russian attacks. The once mighty army that had invaded Russia with ambitions of conquest was reduced to a mere fraction of its original strength. The disastrous Russian campaign significantly weakened Napoleon's military power and marked the beginning of his decline. It emboldened his adversaries in Europe, leading to the formation of the Sixth Coalition against him. The War of the Sixth Coalition began in 1813 and was a decisive conflict that ultimately led to the downfall of Napoleon Bonaparte and marked a turning point in the Napoleonic Wars. The coalition against Napoleon consisted of the United Kingdom, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Sweden, among other European allies who were determined to put an end to French dominance. They could see that there was no better time to do this and took the opportunity they saw. Now this is strategic. Now, surprisingly, this war started off with the intention of making peace throughout the nations. The truce of Pleswitz was declared between Napoleon and the Allies. During this period, diplomatic efforts were made to reach a lasting peace, but the negotiations failed, leading to the resumption of hostilities. We now move on to the Battle of Leipzig. Also known as the Battle of Nations, this confrontation near Leipzig in Saxony was one of the largest battles of the Napoleonic Wars. The Allied forces, commanded by Russian General Kutuzov, Prussian Field Marshal Blücher, Austrian Prince Schwarzenberg, and Swedish Crown Prince Bernadotte, faced Napoleon's army. The battle was fiercely contested over several days, with the Allies gaining the upper hand. Napoleon's forces were eventually overwhelmed by the sheer size and determination of the coalition forces. The defeat at Leipzig marked a significant setback for Napoleon and forced him to retreat westward. Following the Battle of Leipzig, the Allies pursued Napoleon into France. Prussia and Russia liberated large parts of Germany from French control, and the German states began to join the coalition against Napoleon. Now, this is where things get heated. The Allies, consisting of the Seventh Coalition, which included Austria, Prussia, Russia and other European powers successfully invaded France and were closing in on Paris. The campaign culminated in the Battle of Paris, which was fought in late March and early April 1814. On March 30, 1814, the Allies entered Paris after defeating the French forces. The city's fall marked a significant turning point in the Napoleonic Wars and ultimately led to Napoleon's abdication. Facing increasing pressure and recognizing the dire situation, Napoleon chose to step down as Emperor of the French on April 6, 1814. As part of the Treaty of Fontainebleau, signed on April 11, 1814, Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba, 
a small Mediterranean island located off the coast of Italy. Although he retained the title of emperor, his rule was limited to Elba, and he was surrounded by a small contingent of loyal troops. Napoleon's exile to Elba was intended to be a relatively mild punishment, allowing him to retain a degree of sovereignty over the island. However, this period of exile was short-lived, as Napoleon's ambitions and desire for power persisted. Less than a year later, in 1815, he escaped from Elba and returned to France in what became known as the Hundred Days. Interesting. After being forced to abdicate in 1814 and exiled to the island of Elba in the Mediterranean, Napoleon saw an opportunity to make a comeback when tensions rose in Europe following the Congress of Vienna. On February 26, 1815, Napoleon escaped from Elba with the support of a small group of loyal followers. He landed on the French mainland on March 1, 1815, with the intention of reclaiming power. To his advantage, many in France were dissatisfied with the post-Napoleonic Bourbon restoration and the policies of Louis Roman XVIII, who had been installed as the king. As Napoleon marched towards Paris, his charisma and military reputation helped him gain support along the way. The French army, initially sent to intercept him, eventually rallied to his side. By the time he reached Paris on March 20, 1815, he was welcomed by a significant portion of the population and Louis Roman XVIII fled to Belgium. Napoleon's return marked the beginning of the Hundred Days, a period lasting from March 20 to June 22, 1815. During this time, he aimed to consolidate his power, implement domestic reforms, and strengthen his position in Europe. However, his comeback faced significant challenges, especially from the European powers that were determined to suppress him and restore the Bourbon monarchy. Next, folks, we head towards the Battle of Waterloo, fought on June 18, 1815, was a pivotal event in European history that marked the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The conflict took place near the town of Waterloo in present-day Belgium. Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military and political leader, faced off against a coalition of British and Prussian forces commanded by the Duke of Wellington and Field Marshal Jebhard Leberecht von Blücher, respectively. The Battle of Waterloo was the climactic confrontation that ultimately determined his fate. The French forces under Napoleon were well-disciplined and experienced, but they faced a formidable opponent in the combined British and Prussian armies. The battle unfolded over the course of the day, with both sides experiencing fluctuations in fortune. The key moment came in the late afternoon when the Prussian army arrived to reinforce the British. This unexpected turn of events tipped the balance in favor of the Allies. The Battle of Waterloo culminated in the defeat of Napoleon's forces. After this defeat, Napoleon abdicated the throne of France for the second time on June 22, 1815. Following this abdication, he was taken into British custody and eventually exiled to the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic Ocean. The decision to send Napoleon to St. Helena was made by the British government, who wanted to ensure that he would be far away from Europe and any potential supporters. Napoleon arrived on St. Helena on October 15, 1815, and he would spend the remaining six years of his life there until his death on May 5, 1821. St. Helena, with its isolated location and challenging geography, made it an ideal place to keep a high-profile prisoner like Napoleon under close watch. During his time on St. Helena, Napoleon lived in exile under British supervision. Despite being confined, he maintained a certain level of influence and continued to correspond with supporters and write extensively. He lived in Longwood House, a residence provided by the British government, and was allowed some degree of freedom within the constraints of the island. Napoleon's health deteriorated during his time on St. Helena, and he eventually died of stomach cancer on May 5, 1821. His body was initially interred on the island, but in 1840, his remains were repatriated to France and entombed in Les Invalides in Paris, where they remain to this day. Napoleon's time on St. Helena marked the end of his once dominant role in European politics and military affairs. That brings this detailed exploration to a close.
If you have gotten this far, then I am glad you have enjoyed it. How about subscribing to the channel to keep updated about my latest content? You would be doing us both a favor.